morning, Chris Ohl, Wake Forest uh, Baptist Health, Infectious Diseases. Um, towards the end of March now, getting that way. St. Patrick's Day is behind us um, by a day. And uh, so where are we sitting with uh, COVID? Um, well, in the United States, our decline in cases is kind of um, sputtered out, the decline part anyway. Cases still seem to be going. Um, a lot of places are, are on a plateau. There's a few states that are on a slight increase day by day, and there's a few states that are still on a slight decrease day by day. Um, there's some speculation as to um, why, why we're still not seeing a decline like we had been. Probably a couple things going into it. One is, is that um, a lot of places are, uh, are relaxing a bit now, um, quote, opening up. Um, some states much more than others but I think in general people are just feeling a little bit more um, brave to go out maybe go to a restaurant if they haven't been for a while um, get together with some friends um, so there's a little bit more just generalized activity bubble fusions get together people going to public places and I think that accounts for a lot of it there's a lot of speculation how much the variants in the United States might be accounting for um, uh, stagnation of our case decline. Um, in some places it may be contributing more than others. There's some areas where um, the variant percentage is well over 50 percent now. Mostly the B117 variant, that's the one that came out of the UK. Um, we're seeing very few cases of a, of a P1 variant, which is the one out of Brazil or the South African variant. Um, which is good news because those variants um, are a little bit more different than the UK variant. Um, I, I think that they could be contributing a little bit to the um, stagnation of case decline, but I, I think there may be some good news in it because even the places in the country where there's well over 60 percent of, uh, of the circulating virus being the, the UK variant, we're not really seeing explosions of cases, at least yet. Um, but, uh, you know, the concern's always there, um, and if uh, people start really letting down their guard, it's going to, um, it could be a more of a problem. The, um, I'm a little bit concerned about spring break revelry, um, particularly along the, the beaches, um, Florida and Texas and so on. Um, it's not so much the beach itself um, that's the problem because that's outdoors. Usually it's windy, a lot of UV light, which also kills virus. Um, but it's the, it's the nocturnal stuff that happens afterwards. Um, leave the beach, go to the restaurant, hang out in a bar, <clears throat> go to the clubs. Um, and those places are places that are at least uh, depending on the type of place, 2.5 to 10 times this increased risk for getting coronavirus in those kind of places. So, um, so if you're going to go to the beach, the beach part's fine. Um, it's uh, think about what you're going to do afterwards. Um, <clears throat> I know a lot of people are thinking about traveling um, right now or close to, as the, particularly in our area here, as the public schools go into spring break. Um, and the, the advice hasn't changed. Actually, the CDC's advice is still to quarantine for 10 days after travel. Um, and, uh, and, and they're kind of serious about that. Uh, and that's uh, one, uh, one reason is, is so that we can decrease the, um, the, the um, travel of variants between different areas of the United States. Here in North Carolina, we don't have a ton of variant around. We'd like to keep it that way. Um, and so if you are traveling, remember if you're visiting friends or family, keep the number of people that you visit um, down, even if you've been vaccinated. If you're, um, if you're visiting one group of people or one family and they've all been vaccinated, um, the CDC guidance is now that and you've been vaccinated and they've been vaccinated and you're getting together one household and one household, you don't have to mask. Um, but if you're having more and more people um, together, that's called a party um, or a get together, um, then, um, then you probably should be masking, um, particularly if there's not any unvaccinated people in there. And you definitely should be taking it outside and masking if there's any unvaccinated people who are higher risk, which is basically over the age of 60, 
or any medical condition. So it's something to think about um, as you're visiting friends and family over the holidays. <clears throat> Um, a, few, uh, a few things that have been going on over the past week that are probably worth mentioning. Uh, one is, is uh, the CDC came out and said that there were three or four pieces of guidance that they had put out since the beginning of the pandemic, which might have been altered or changed somewhat because of political pressure. Uh, news to the CDC. We already knew that at the time, but um, we had figured it out. But, um, you know, it's, uh, it's just a, a comment that it's never helpful when political aspects get involved in public health guidance. And so I think uh, kudos to them for, um, for recognizing it and putting it out there for transparency. Um, there's been some um, developments on uh, what we know a little bit about immunity. Um, from either vaccine or from uh, the disease itself, uh, it's, it still appears that the majority of people uh, after having COVID are immune for six months. Maybe some, some studies say eight months. I say majority. Uh, there are some reinfections that do occur um, in some people. It, we have a, a study now that just came out this week um, in The Lancet that, uh, that shows that the older you are, the more likely your natural immunity from infection will wane. Uh, so uh, if, you're, if you're over the age of 60, 65, 70, um, your chance of getting a reinfection, if again exposed, uh, is uh, roughly about 40% of what it was if you were 20. And so, um, so the older you are, the, the quicker your natural immunity wanes. The good news is, though, is that um, vaccine seems to still be robust, even in the elderly uh, over time, at least over the amount of time that we know since we've started using vaccines or we've started doing the trials. So uh, what does all that mean? It means that um, probably for all of us, but particularly if you're older, um, then and you've had COVID, you should get vaccinated. So, you know, I hear some people say, well, I already had it, so probably don't need it. No, you should get vaccinated. It'll boost your natural immunity. And the immunity from vaccines seems to be more robust than it is from natural infection. And that's for all of us. So right now the guidance is, is if you've had COVID, uh, get vaccinated, and if it's a two-shot series, get both shots. Don't just get one shot. I know there's been some discussion that maybe one shot's enough in the people who've been previously infected, but uh, this data would seem to suggest you should get both shots if it's a two-shot series. Um, a, uh, a little bit of a change in the CDC's quarantine guidance, that if you have been vaccinated, and you are exposed to somebody with COVID, um, then uh, you don't need to quarantine. Uh, a week ago, they said, uh, if you've been exposed, you don't need to quarantine if it's been within three months of your vaccine. Now they're saying you don't need to quarantine. So they took the three month part away. So what does that mean? Uh, it means that if you got vaccinated in January, at least as it stands right now, and you're exposed in August, you still don't need to quarantine. So there's no time limitation on it. Um, what do we know um, about, um, about boosters? Um, um, we don't know any more than we knew a week ago. Um, the, the, most of, the, most of the, um, the pharmaceutical companies that are making vaccines are, are putting, are making uh, vaccines that have the strains from the new variant in them. Most of these are multivalent, which means that the wild type is in there and all of the variants that we know to be important um, are in there as well. And um, so when might we need to be getting boosted for that? Um, we'll have to wait and see. I suspect it, it'll be, um, um, if we, I'm guessing that if we recommend being boosted, that recommendation will come sometime towards the late fall, early winter, but that's a little bit more than just a guess right now. Um, 
new vaccines on the horizons. Uh, there's uh, two um, that look we're looking at for potential licensure in the United States in addition to the three that we have now. Uh, one of which is AstraZeneca's vaccine, which has been out for a while in most countries and in fact is um, one of the uh, most used vaccines in the world outside of the United States. Not yet licensed in the United States. Uh, it's being looked at by the FDA right now. I think the advisory committee will meet on that in April and the CIP in April and we'll see what they say. So it's possible that vaccine might be out in April. If you're following world news, um, there several countries in the world have stopped using the AstraZeneca vaccine in the last week because of the possibility of blood clots um, and, um, that in people that follow the vaccine. Um, while that's still being kind of worked out and looked at, um, some of the early more vigorous looks at the information suggest that it's no more common than in the population of unvaccinated people and that there's no causality associated with the vaccine and the blood clot. But a lot of places are still looking at it a little bit more. We still have a little bit more data to vet. Um, but um, but um, it's kind of looking like the blood clot concern may not as be of a big idea or a big, big of a problem as what um, had been put out there a few days ago. The other vaccine that um, looks like will be coming up for licensure uh, here in the United States is uh, Novavax's nanoparticle vaccine, which is, uh, puts little parts of the spike protein on a nanoparticle, an adjuvant uh, that helps uh, stimulate immunity. And depending on, um, on whether the FDA will accept uh, other countries' data, the UK data on that one on the trial, that'll either be coming up in May or July. Um, so that uh, will be some help coming up uh, for the summertime. Um, and uh, we'll see if that's one shot or two shot. Um, AstraZeneca's is two. Um, so we'll, um, right now the only one shot vaccine that we have available to us is Johnson & Johnson's. And there's a trial going on to see if two shots might actually improve it a little bit more than one shot. And we'll see how, how that data uh, shapes up. Um, other, other news that's going on in the world of vaccines, um, you're going to start seeing more and more vaccine get out there. We had a big event uh, here in uh, Forsyth County this past weekend at the fairgrounds, vaccinated 7,752 people. Um, and then the, uh, the leftover vaccine, the health department used the next day and we used at a couple other sites that needed vaccine um, on the, just after the weekend. Um, the FEMA site, uh, which is uh, the federal site in Greensboro, is open and giving vaccines. There is a program called the FEMA Spoke Program where they distribute vaccines that are federal vaccines. That is an allocation above that of the states or your local allocation. So it's like <coughs> extra vaccine for you to use. We um, are going to have spoke sites uh, here in Forsyth County and the one spoke site uh, Winston-Salem State University is already open um, and um, there will be vaccine clinics at, uh, at Winston-Salem State uh, University weekly. It's a great place uh, to have a vaccine clinic, lots of parking, pretty convenient, uh, good venue uh, and it's close to marginalized populations where access to health care is a little bit tougher. Uh, so we're real excited about that. Um, there are more mobile clinics trying to get out, particularly for elderly people uh, who have trouble getting into a vaccine site, and that's happening. Um, both uh, Novant and Wake Forest are working with uh, faith groups uh, to have faith-based, um, church-centered, community-centered vaccine sites. And so uh, keep your eyes peeled um, for vaccine sites that are becoming available to you. There'll be more and more uh, vaccine coming up now in the next few weeks. Uh, allocations start going up next week, I think. Um, and that's good because starting this week, there are more people eligible in North Carolina to get vaccine. Um, and in fact, uh, it's now open to anyone with a um, basically a medical condition. I won't go through the list because it's long, but if you see a doctor for a medical condition, it looks like you're eligible. 
um, and um, and that's uh, that's good news uh, because that's one group of people um, who've been very patiently waiting uh, while we've gotten through the other priority groups. Um, We'll be doing our homeless populations and getting our prison populations vaccinated, both, uh, both important areas for public health reasons, and then uh, colleges and other dormitory congregate settings will open up on the 7th. So for those college students who aren't in a, um, in a frontline worker category or in a, um, uh, in a category of uh, having a medical condition, so, um, so that's, uh, that's all really exciting news. I think by the end of April here in North Carolina, again a guess, but a pretty good guess, that um, vaccination will be open to everyone and anyone. Uh, and there won't be any prioritization. And so what does that mean? That means in the next two to three months, we're gonna be giving a lot of shots in North Carolina. Roughly just under 25% of the North Carolina population has been vaccinated so far. Over 65% in our priority groups, particularly in the elderly. Um, so, I guess that's good news. But I mean, 75% haven't. Um, so we got we got some work to do yet uh, to get up to that uh, status of herd immunity, which is what we're going to need to really uh, start relaxing um, some of our restrictions and such. Um, other things going on um, is that. Uh, um, we still are having somewhat explosive outbreaks of COVID in colleges and universities. The latest one to, to have the fun with this is Duke um, over the past week or so. Um, I think their case numbers are coming down, but they've been on a shelter in place um, order for all of their students um, and faculty and staff uh, at the university. So uh, COVID still takes opportunities, um, particularly in unvaccinated people. And um, I'll get to that uh, in a minute, what, uh, how that might affect our, um, our world in a year or so. So uh, one last thing uh, is children's, children's clinical trials for vaccines. Um, Moderna just announced that they'll be starting their clinical trials for I think it's age six months, up to 12 years. They already have ongoing trials for uh, 12 years um, to 18 years. Um, and that's important because uh, we need to get our kids immunized. Um, so the, um, the trials that are ongoing for the 12 to 18 year olds will probably wrap up sometime this summer. So I'm, I'm uh, optimistic we'll have some vaccine for our older kids, um, so either right before they go back to school or uh, in the first uh, three weeks of school. Um, but yet for our younger kids, um, those less than the age of 12, it's going to take a while to get these trials done. One of the main reasons is we've got to figure out what the dose is for little people. Um, you know, how much do you need of the antigen um, or, the, um, or the, the antibody producing stuff in the vaccine? So obviously it's less than in an adult that we have to dose range it. So, so I suspect it'll be well into 2022 before our under 12 year olds. Uh, will be eligible. Um, so, um, you know, I um, get asked questions and we're going to go through some specific questions, mostly about vaccines in a minute. Um, but um, somebody asked me a question the other day that really uh, made me think and it was kind of a fun question to think about and that was, uh, Dr. O, what do you think that the, uh, that the world is going to look like here in the United States, our world and our lives in the U.S. Um, in the spring of 2022? That's kind of far off. It's a year off. Um, some would say it's not so far off, I guess. So here, here's, here's how some things that um, the way I would see it is, first of all, most of us won't be thinking about COVID every day. And um, that's a change, right? Because I think right now, probably everyone thinks about it every day. You put your mask on, you think about COVID. Um, you say, hey, I want to go to a restaurant, but there's only 30% of the tables open. You think about COVID, so on and so forth. So I think in a year, we won't be thinking about it every day. Um, it won't be gone. Um, and likely will never be gone totally. 
uh, but it'll start to fade into the potpourri of respiratory viruses that we have, um, that we deal with every year. Um, some people will still be masking, and maybe that's a good thing. Uh, because we found out that the masking thing that has a lot of benefits to us, actually, other than preventing COVID. Uh, the number of cases of influenza in Forsyth County so far this year is either, I th the last I looked, it was zero. That's been actually recorded. Maybe it's a handful, but that's nothing. So masking prevents flu. So, um, you know, so maybe Wearing masks during cold and flu season is a good thing, both to protect you and to protect others, in addition to vaccination for flu and medications we take for flu. Um, maybe we'll still be masking on airplanes because viral infections we've known for a long time transmit on, on airplanes, everything from chicken pox to the flu to the colds. So, you know, when you think about it, who really wants to get sick during cold and flu season. Who wants to get up in the middle of the night and see your seven-year-old daughter with a fever uh, and a cough? Nobody. So if you can prevent sickness from wearing a mask during cold and flu season, maybe we will. A little bit of a societal decision, but also a public health consideration. So let's say it's March of 2022. Um, and your daughter, your seven-year-old daughter, wakes up in the middle of the night and has a fever and a cough. So what are you gonna do the next morning? You're gonna call your pediatrician and they're gonna get you in and you're gonna take your daughter in and they're gonna do a test, likely for the things we do now, strep and flu, but also for COVID, maybe a few other respiratory viruses at the same time because we'll have a lot more testing platforms out in the world by then because we've put them out there for COVID. And then they say, well, your daughter's got COVID, um, so you're going to have to stay home uh, for 10 days. Um, but here's a prescription, and this will take the edge off uh, and shorten the duration of symptoms and shorten the severity of symptoms. Because right now we have a few trials of oral drugs that look pretty good, actually, for ameliorating symptoms and shortening the duration of viral shedding. Maybe by that time, if you take the pills and you take the whole bit, your quarantine's only five days instead of 10 days because you shorten the duration of viral shedding. So we're gonna have oral therapies available to us in a year. So what does that seem, sort of sound like? You, you get sick, you go get tested, and you get a medicine, you get a prescription, just like you would for flu. You can get some Tamiflu. It's gonna be that way for COVID too. And then your doctor says, well, do you have anyone in the house um, that might be at higher risk for getting COVID? And you'll say, well, yeah, there's Cousin Eddie. Cousin Eddie didn't want to get a vaccine. He never has. He's 72 years old. He hangs out a lot in the basement and watches TV. But he hangs out. He loves to play with my granddaughter. And then you're going to say, here's a prescription for Cousin Eddie. Have him take this once a day. And it's going to prevent him from getting COVID. And so oral drugs that work against COVID will also prevent it. So th those are going to be on the horizon out there. And I think in a year that our, that our world might look a little bit like that. Schools. Schools will still not have a lot of vaccinated children in the fall, right? And so we have to remember that. COVID's going to take advantage of that. Um, and so we're going to have to still be careful in schools. Uh, the six-foot rule might come down to three feet. I think it probably will, but which means we'll be able to get more kids in schools and that they'll be able to have a little bit more of a normal experience in schools. But we're still going to be dealing with school clusters. And if you get a cluster in a class, we'll be testing around that cluster, identifying the cluster, quarantining that cluster um, and uh, until we can get our kids vaccinated. Um, and so um, there'll still be a lot of public health going around and identifying cases and testing people around the clusters, but we won't have these widespread waves that are affecting us in public health anymore. I see that probably on the horizon for fall, late fall, maybe even the spring. These huge waves that totally, you know, 
saturate our hospitals and shut things down, I think will be a thing of the past. So that's a little bit about how I see the future coming. Um, and uh, uh, so, you know, will it completely be like the way it was before COVID? It'll never be completely the way it was. It never is, is it? Because time goes on, things change, we do things differently, we learn and respond. But we're going to have a lot more technology out and a lot more things to fight all sorts of viral diseases and uh, not, just, uh, not just COVID. And it's going to be because we learned and we did science uh, during the time of COVID and took opportunities. It's just like how HIV taught us how to deal with a lot of viruses when we did our HIV research. Now we can treat Hep C. That came out of the world of HIV research. So. We have the battering ram of technology. The virus has the battering ram of uh, evolution. Um, and I, uh, I'm optimistic that our battering ram of technology will be better than viruses' battering ram. So let's go to a few questions. Um, the first, a lot of these dealing with vaccine, which is cool, because there will always be vaccine questions. Um, the, um, the first one is, is that, um, uh, my workplace has been told um, that um, that the, va the shot that we just got now will only be good for three years, uh, I mean three months, sorry, I misspoke. Um, so I I've been told, our workplace was told that the shot we just got for everyone in our workplace is only good for three months. And so after three months we're going to have to quarantine or get a booster and, uh, and so you won't be able to go back to work in a normal way after three months of getting your shot. That's actually false from a lot of reasons. One is, is that uh, it looks like that the exception for quarantine for vaccinated people is going to be a lot long lasting than three months. Um, and, um, and in fact, the CDC just did that last week. So, um, so that part's false. The other one is, is that you'll have to get a booster to go back to work. No, you won't. I don't think the boosters will be coming up um, until later, uh, much later, and it'll be boosters for everyone, not just for you to go back to work. But it'll be like a flu shot that we get every year for all of us. Um, and there'll still be some residual immunity that you have, even if you don't get boosted. The booster just, just makes it better. So, so anyway, um, no concerns on that one. Um, after three months, you're still cool. You'll be all right. So Patricia said, I had no reaction whatsoever when I got my first and second dose of Moderna. And there are a lot of people saying, ah, oh, boy, man, you were lucky. Uh, not even soreness at the ejection site. Can I be sure that the vaccine will protect me since we're told that the mild reactions were a sign the vaccine was working? Well, it is a sign that the vaccine was working if you have mild reactions, but if you don't have them, it still works. And we know that from the clinical trials. So let's just take a 30-year-old person who got Moderna's vaccine. Roughly 18% of people will have a fever, sort of that fatigue, and maybe headachey, achy feeling the next day. Doesn't last long, and other people get soreness at the, at the site. At the site, roughly 60% of people get it, but that means 40% of people don't. And you know what? They responded just as well and they were protected just as well. So if you didn't get the, um, the expected reactions, no worries. Um, you're still in the, in the uh, protected group and the efficacy is no different. It doesn't really mean anything to you. So uh, go out and celebrate if you had no expected reactions. Ashley, how long are the vaccines effective for? I have friends that were vaccinated as healthcare workers in December and early January and other friends who won't be vaccinated in May. Would the early vaccinated friends have immunity in May or June for a potential get together? Well, from what we look at now, the people who are vaccinated early on will still have immunity this summer. Um, and uh, so yeah, you will be able to get together if you were vaccinated in May. Uh, per the guidelines that we'll have available at that time. Again, I think if we're going to start boosting, it's going to be a little ways off. Um, and, uh, and I don't think in the short term we need to be concerned about it. Angela asks, will these COVID shots be a one-time thing or will they like the flu shot every year? I'm predicting 
that they might be in every year or in every five year or somewhere in between. We just don't know yet to pin it down any more than that. Think about it, we have a lot of shots we get boosted for, right? You get boosted for tetanus every five or 10 years, depending on your group. Um, you get boosted for whooping cough. You get boosted for meningitis if you're still having a risk exposure. Um, and uh, we, we boost travelers for typhoid. Um, in fact, it's actually more likely that you'll get a boost booster from a shot than you will not. So um, I think there will be boosters. How often we'll get them yet, yeah, we'll have to wait and see. My whole family has been vaccinated except for my eight-year-old granddaughter. When we, when we get together as a family inside, what kind of precautions we need to take with her? Can we gather inside without masks? <coughs> Excuse me. I think for, so if everyone's been vaccinated other than an eight-year-old, I would say that you can take, um, you can do things inside unmasked. The CDC says if it's small groups of unvaccinated people and they have no high risk of infection or high risk for, for um, complications of COVID, um, then um, you can do it unmasked. So particularly an eight-year-old um, tends to not get COVID as much. If they do get COVID, there's not as much virus around. Um, and so I would think it would be fine. Um, and so, uh, but if you're getting together with a family and there's 13 people and they're all been unvac unvaccinated, um, yeah, then I would wear a mask. So for those beach vacations, those multifamily, um, extended family beach vacations, um, yeah, you might want to wear a mask when you're indoors still. I have been fully vaccinated with Moderna. I understand that I'll probably have a booster in six to 12 months. Well, we just talked about that. Maybe. Um, beyond that, will I always be committed to Moderna uh, or would I always be committed to a message RNA or could I change to another preventive vaccine in say two years? Yeah, I think you'll be able to, for the boosters, I think um, we'll have to wait and see how it goes. Probably early on we'll want people to get the same booster from the same um, organization that made the original, but I think as time goes on, um, you will be able to mix and match it up some. And um, um, maybe for the first booster, nah, we want people to stay with the same, the same committed vaccine. But I think after that, we'll be able to mix and match it. I mean, we, 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 in other vaccines, we use multiple companies, um, hepatitis A and influenza, and it, we can change it up. It doesn't really matter so much. I've read that we should avoid over-the-counter meds for treatment of symptoms after the vaccine. I'd love to be able to take something after the second dose if it doesn't actually hurt immunity. Does it matter? I will tell you, after my second dose of vaccine, I took ibuprofen. <laughs> so uh, I think it's fine uh, to take something for pain, fever, aches, whatever after your vaccine. And um, really, we have no evidence that it hurts immunity. And actually for some other vaccines, not COVID vaccine, but for some other vaccines where it's been studied, it doesn't seem to make any difference. So if you feel bad, take something to feel better. I have considered the J&J &J vaccine because it's one shot, asked Kimberly, but I have had Bell's palsy in the past. What are the chances of recurrence? There are chances of recurrence of Bell's palsy after getting any of the COVID vaccines, Johnson & Johnson, Moderna, Pfizer, any of the ones that are out there right now is exactly the same as if you wouldn't have gotten a vaccine. So it doesn't impact on it uh, and it doesn't cause recurrences of it. Every now and then people get recurrences of Bell's palsy and it just happens. And um, there's no one particular event or any one particular thing um, that seems to trigger that. Uh, Becky asks, my daughter had a mild case of COVID in December, uh, but she lost taste and smell and does not have either. Is there anything that we can do to encourage those to return? You know, that's a, that's a great question um, because some people do have very long, prolonged loss of taste and smell, and it really does kind of impact on your life. I mean, you've seen articles in the paper about chefs and stuff. You know, food science people who've lost their sense of taste, it impacts their lives. So for some people, it seems to last a long time. Um, 
the, I think that the good news is that the majority of people do gradually get it back. Um, and um, I, I'm seeing some information that most, almost everyone gets it back by, uh, by somewhere between six months to a year. Some people get it back right away, but um, sometimes it takes longer. But I, I think that, um, that uh, is there anything you can do to make it come back faster? You know, there's some, some stuff that people are trying and some, um, but there's really nothing yet that I've seen that, that actually is, is effective for that. Um, but if, you, if your loss of smell or taste lasts more, um, you know, than three to four months, um, you, can, um, you can consult an expert um, in smell and taste senses, usually they're within the realm of ear, nose, and throat. So talk to an ear, nose, and throat person that um, is within your health system's uh, referral network, and they might get to, they can try getting it to you because there are things that can be done with um, repeat um, stimulation or um, so things that have been tried uh, for other conditions where smell and taste have been lost. Timothy says, I manage a local Gaelic football team. Well, that sounds like fun. Bet you guys had a big party yesterday. <laughs> so, Gaelic football is a traditional Irish sport, semi-contact, and players can touch the ball with their hands and feet. Is it same to reduce training and compete in games and tournaments? So, you know, I've spent a lot of time actually thinking about different sports and safety with different sports, and it's come up in advising schools, um, either high schools, um, or um, you know K through 12, or or colleges and universities. In fact, there's infectious disease uh, advisors for every NCAA related sport, um, and um, and so some of them, some sports are a lot safer than others. Anytime you have contact involved, um, the risk is is higher. So I, the ultimate, I guess, would be wrestling, right? Um, but um, so Gaelic football, if there's contact involved, there is some risk with it. Uh, some of the, uh, the, there are some things that help. One, it's outdoors, um, and two, it's, um, um, uh, while you might not keep it on long, um, you probably should be wearing a mask with that kind of type of sport. So for Gaelic football, if it was a university or a college asking me, whether or not that would be something to bring back safely for intramurals, I'd probably put it in the red zone and not, not at this time. Maybe as we get into the summer or fall. Um, so a lot of the people who do things like college rugby teams, for instance, you know, find ways to, um, to do it in a non-contact way. You can still do drills, you can still work out, but scrumming is uh, kind of out of the question right now and probably will for a few more months. So I'm sorry I didn't have such great news for you on that one. Um, Heather, with no long-term studies available, how do we know that there are no negative effects from the vaccine that we may experience in the future? Well, some of it, um, some of it comes down to um, for knowing um, the sciences and how um, things occur. So, um, while we haven't been doing using COVID vaccines for a real long time, there's been studies with other messenger RNA and, and with DNA vaccines that have been going on for about 20 years. In fact, as a fellow, when I was a fellow, a student several years ago, um, actually, um, um, I was uh, doing work with the DNA vaccine uh, for malaria. And so we have a lot of experience with other messenger RNA and DNA vaccines. And we haven't seen any long-term effects for them. Um, the other thing is, is we kind of know what's going on with the vaccine, and we kind of know what goes on with uh, cellular responses and how cells and biology works. And so um, one can extrapolate that if all the messenger RNA in the vaccine, for instance, is gone in uh, in 10 days, um, then the odds of it producing any problems down the road are minuscule to none. Um, and we do a lot of uh, preclinical studies with uh, other animals and other biological systems to look for things that might be surprises. So 
Um, you know, I guess it's like anything else in our in our world. There's never a hundred percent guarantee for anything. Um, you buy a brand new car. There's never not a hundred percent guarantee that your car won't have a recall in a year because the accelerator has an issue. Um, but you know, we do everything we can uh, in the interim, and those events are are pretty unusual. So. I'm not concerned about it uh, with the vaccines that we have now um, because I've been working with vaccines and thinking about vaccines for a long time and um, kind of have a feeling how these things go. Um, and then Kathy asks, uh, kind of on the same note, how can we respond to friends who argue that the vaccines are not safe since they've not been FDA approved? Um, so this gets down to what's the difference between an emergency use approval and, an FDA, and a full approval from the FDA. So an emergency use approval, what it means is, is that based on the clinical trial data and everything that we know, that the, that the benefits um, clearly, clearly outweigh any risks. Whereas in a full approval, usually there are other entities that something is compared to um, and for a full approval you need two separate full clinical trials done in different ways um, and from uh, different sponsors um, or not sponsors but done in different ways um, with different populations in order to get a full approval. So for the um, for the vaccines that we have now, we combine it all into one large trial, and um, and so as time goes on, other trials are being done with the same vaccines. So full approval will come, and it's probably full approval is not too far off for these. I would suspect uh, it could be even possible by the end of the year. Um, so. Um, I, I think in this case, because of the way the trials were done and how they were put out and the data we have, that an emergency use authorization is as good as an FDA approval uh, as far as, um, you know, what you're thinking should be. So tell your friends that, uh, that the EUA is good enough and um, get vaccinated because the benefits clearly outweigh the risks. So. I think I got through all the questions I have from here, so I'll open it up to questions uh, from the uh, panel, if there are any. Okay, I have a few. Um, first off, more on the vaccine hesitancy overall. Obviously, um, there's work being done. You were talking about earlier of reaching the marginalized populations and everything, but more word is coming out that it's a lot of Republicans who are coming out and saying they don't believe in it or that there's you know, other conspiracy theories and, and things like that. Um, and I'm, I, I'm interested to know what your main concern is when it comes to reaching herd immunity in the state. Yeah, so the, um, the, the, the upshot is, is there's vaccine hesitancy in different groups, including Republicans. Um, and um, so what are my thoughts about that and how it might impact on herd immunity? Well, obviously, uh, if there's large groups of people who don't get vaccinated, um, true herd immunity will be hard to reach. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that over time, um, vaccine hesitancy will start to fade some. Um, you know, there really should be no political consideration in, in whether or not you want to get vaccinated. Um, and, um, and so I'll just leave that aside on that. Um, but if you have questions and you want more information, um, there's a lot of different places to reach out to to get it um, and places and people to talk to. You can start with your own physician or somebody you trust in healthcare, or you can go to either a governmental or a non-governmental website and learn about it. Um, I would. Try to be careful, though, about looking for your medical information on the web, and that goes even further than COVID, because um, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, but you know, as time goes on, um, I, hesitancy seems to be softening some, because people are saying, hey, you know, the people around me are getting it, and they seem fine. And in fact, 
they're looking at, they can now get together with their grandparents and not have to mask and not have to worry. Um, and so, um, and I, I think that as we're learning more that the vaccines are actually better than natural immunity, that might kind of help people who are saying, well, I already got COVID, so why do I need a shot? Because the vaccine might be better. It is better. It'll boost you. And then, um, and then lastly, um, you know, as time goes on, it, it, very likely COVID vaccination is going to be included in, you know, routine childhood of vaccine, you know, way down the road. And if you want to travel, you're probably going to have to have it. And so um, there's going to be other reasons to get vaccinated other than just to try to not get COVID or give it to other people. Um, and, um, and so, you know, where, what do we do now when we have diseases that, um, where we have herd immunity, but there's still pockets of, of hesitancy and thus unvaccinated people? Then we have clusters and outbreaks of infections in that group, right? Think about measles um, and the measles outbreaks where you were having um, occasionally mumps outbreaks, chickenpox outbreaks and people who have not been vaccinated. And so we deal with those outbreaks and clusters as a, in, as a public health thing and we test and quarantine and isolate. So we're going to be doing the same things for COVID. So as we get closer to as we get closer and closer and closer to herd immunity or we approach herd immunity we're going to see a shift from these big you know waves of widespread community transmission into pocketed clusters of transmission that we respond to and test and isolate and quarantine and then offer vaccination to that group again so, I mean, that's what we do in public health, and so it'll be the same for COVID. A long answer, but a, a complicated question and a good one. Um, and uh, one more. Uh, so if someone says that they want to make plans to, you know, for later in the summer, maybe in August, per se, um, and they want to go ahead and buy traveling tickets or maybe event tickets to something that might be happening later then, should they feel confident in making those kinds of purchases now? Is yeah. saying that by July 4th, things could be normal? Should they feel confident past then to make plans, travel, buying event tickets? Right. Like yeah, so what do you, you know, so what if you were want, thinking about wanting to do something and that something costs a little bit of money? <laughs> and should I make that investment? Because, you know, the, if you don't do it now, you're not going to get them, right? It's kind of like getting a beach house for the summer for a week or two. If you haven't already booked it, it's going to get it's getting tight. So um, what I what I guess the corollary to that is is let's say you're planning a vacation and it's in the middle of hurricane season, you know, in January, and you're planning on going and spending two weeks in the Wilmington Beach. You know, how do you feel about that? Well, you'd probably get trip insurance, uh, and you'd probably get hurricane insurance, and that's available also for the these things so um, so um, if you're going to be doing a significant investment that involves travel particularly if it's international travel uh, I would back it up with insurance um, tri trip cancellation insurance it's a bit expensive but that'd be a good investment I think if it was something that was involving international travel um, let's say you're thinking of a big safari and you're going to go see uh, Victoria Falls and Kruger National Park and do the South African thing for two weeks and you want to do it in August. It's still going to be a little bit risky because a lot of the, a lot of the world is still is going to be catching up on the vaccine realm and so it's going to take them longer. And international travel is still going to be, you're going to be needed to test before going, test before coming back. And some, maybe some places, some airlines and some safari groups and such might be requiring vaccination. So um, that one's a little bit on the riskier side. Cruise ships, I think, are going to be off the table for a while yet. So I wouldn't be planning a cruise in August or September, even if you could. But you know, there's a lot of other things 
um, hey, you know, I always wanted to do that cross-country trip and go see the Grand Canyon. I think that's a pretty safe bet. Um, or, you know, I wanted to fly out to Glacier National Park. I've always wanted to do it. It's on the bucket list. I think that's a pretty safe bet. So things that you're doing where there's a lot of outdoor activities and, um, and it's not extremely complicated or extended travel, I think is fine. Uh, what about a concert? Um, you know, like, a, we'll have to see. That's all going to depend on, on capacity limits for these venues. I think by the end of the summer they're going to be loosening up some, um, but they may not be back to 100% normal. Um, if you wanted to see, you know, your favorite um, jazz singer in a small club, you know, um, you'll have, we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Some places are talking about requiring everyone going, you know, to these small indoor events to be vaccinated before going. So. Um, so I think you could probably do it, um, and it probably will happen. You'll just have to see how comfortable you feel with it. And one last question. Uh, so a long time ago, similar to what you were saying today, making predictions <laughs> for the spring of next year, a long time ago you made a prediction saying that by July 4th we would be in the clear, and that prediction seems to be coming to fruition. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, how, how do you feel knowing that? Yeah, how do I feel? Yeah, I, I did. I made a prediction last July 4th by, by July 4th. I didn't say, we'll be, you know, everything will be completely like it was, but I'd say, you know what, we'll be m much more normal. It won't be, we won't, it won't be nearly as onerous, and we're going to start to be thinking about We can do things again, and, and it won't be nearly so oppressive. And interestingly, another very famous person made the same prediction. Just two weeks ago, President Biden said it. So, um, so just remember it. You heard it here first. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that's still going to be the way it is. Actually, um, you know, there'll be some things that it still won't be happening. You know, we, it, that'll still be hard to do. Um, but uh, but I think a lot of the things that we enjoy and we want to do, we will be able to um, go to a restaurant. Um, see a play. It may be a little bit different how you go see it, but you know, maybe every other seat instead of every seat for a while. But um, you know, have a Fourth of July get together with your family, um, travel some. International still might be hard, but domestic I think will be pretty open. You might have to do some extra things. But, you know, we learned how to deal with extra things after 9-11, so I think we can do extra things with travel, too, so. But, yeah, that was my prediction, and I, stay, I stick with it. <laughs> Any other questions? All right, sounds good. We'll uh, see you next week. <laughs>